Okay, so welcome everybody. I see there are many participants online. Um, so welcome to this open event I titled Whistleblowing an International Perspective. Uh, my name is Silvia Ravazzani and today my role is to introduce and moderate uh, this uh, uh, debate about whistleblowing uh, together with Professor Alessandra Mazzelli. And uh, this open event is promoted by uh, CERC and uh, Ufficio Fari Internazionali uh, of Università, Università Ulm, uh, Get of State Consortium and Transparency International Italy. And uh, well, a special welcome uh, actually to our students uh, in corporate communication from our bachelor degree in corporate communication and public relations and our students in marketing consumption and communication from our master degree in marketing consumption and communication uh, as this uh, you know event is a part an integral part of these two courses and actually for my bachelor students uh, this is the first of a series of lectures uh, that will be dedicated to employee communication and voice within organization uh, while for uh, our master's students, this is actually the last lectures or in a series of lectures uh, dedicated to voice, silence and communication uh, within organizations. And I extend, of course, a warm welcome to all other, other students and academics and practitioners who are actually attending this event with us today. So uh, this event takes the form of uh, a debate uh, with the contributions of uh, Audrey Diaz Lawson, uh, who is senior lecturer at the School of Public Relations and Journalism at Leeds Beckett University. And um, Audra also recently contributed to the book Whistleblowing uh, Communication and Consequences, Lessons from the Norwegian National Lottery. And then we have Giorgio Fraschini, uh, who is an expert uh, of whistleblowing at Transparency International Italy. So af after listening to our international guests, uh, we will open up the debate uh, to the audience, to everybody uh, attending th this event, so that they can um, share their thoughts on this topic or ask questions to our speakers. Um, but uh, before we get started with this debate, I'd like, you know, just um, to say just a few words by way of introduction. Uh, I assume that not all of you are familiar with the concept and the practice of whistleblowing in organizations. So I will shortly define this phenomenon for you to give you, you know, the context. Um, so whistleblowing is related to corporate wrongdoing. Uh, and corporate wrongdoing is a major issue uh, today in all kinds of organizations. Um, corporate wrongdoing ranges from, you know, serious illegality to unprofessional or improper, uh, improper behavior in the workplace. And wrongdoing is the very activity or conduct uh, which uh, whistleblowing seeks uh, to address uh, and ultimately uh, put to an end. Uh, and you have to consider that in many cases, employees uh, inside organizations are those who can discover uh, frauds and bribery, uh, discrimination, unfair treatments and, and the likes. So whistleblowing can be defined as the disclosure by organizational members, former or current, of illegal, immoral or illegitimate practices under the control of their employers, their organizations, to persons or organizations that may be able to affect action, who may be able to act when they get this information for employees. So the practice of whistleblowing highlights the importance of employee voice and freedom of speech within an organization and of the active and constructive expression of dissent in particular. So in order to encourage uh, an employee observing, um, uh, you know, uh, questionable actions uh, to blow the whistle, uh, an organization can put in place a formal uh, whistleblowing arrangement. 
So a simple and clear set of internal and external channels and procedures for employees who want to raise a concern. So whistleblowing arrangements are very important uh, because they help prevent external whistleblowing, uh, which generates uh, you know, uh, crisis and related reputational damage. And this happens when employees decide to report, you know, the misconduct to a third party outside of the organization, such as the media or law enforcement. Um, so uh, whistleblowing arrangements uh, facilitate actually internal positive change and discourage future wrongdoing. So uh, in this context, we can say that employee communication is key to make employees aware about the existence and the mechanisms of whistleblowing arrangements uh, and signal that you know, the organization, the management desire to listen to employees and to uh, correct wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. So this was all for me by way of introduction. So I hope I have you know, um, offered a good, you know, uh, even uh, very short of this uh, phenomenon in organizations. Now, I'd like to invite our guests uh, to take the floor. Um, I have uh, one question uh, for you um, to get started. And the question is, if you could please um, tell us, uh, you know, about your perspective on whistleblowing, sharing with, our, with, with us your knowledge and your experience uh, as experts in this field. And I would actually invite Audra to go first. Um, so uh, the floor is yours uh, whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you very much, Audra. And I'm going to just um, share very quickly a few, mm -hmm. just a few slides as I chat, because I think it'll help make it, the case and the perspective a little bit easier. Um, as Sylvia mentioned that I just completed a book chapter in this book, The Whistleblowing, uh, The Communication con and Consequences of It. And this was a case about Norwe the Norwegian National Lottery or Norsk tipping. And what's interesting about the Norwegian lottery is that it is a state lottery. So it was set up in the late 1940s in order to promote Norwegian sport and the cultural sector. So the mission of the Norsk tipping was in and of itself social responsibility. And it's an interesting, of course, um, tension between, between gaming and social responsibility. But over time, questions began to emerge about the expenditure of funds. And in particular, Per Jakob Svenkern, and I completely just butchered his name, as Svenkerund, who was the head of Norse Tipping's communication, started to identify some problems in expenditures like a little bit of an expensive holiday from some of the executives. Some of the um, expenditures being focused in the area where Norse Tipping was housed versus evenly distributed across Norway. And what Sylvia was talking about in terms of the internal components of this he tried to speak to his immediate boss um, and, and tried to resolve the situation internally. Yet when that wasn't possible, he went externally to the, the Board of Governors, the, the oversight for Norsk tipping. And what ultimately happened was that he spent two and a half years fundamentally as an undercover agent uh, within Norsk tipping while the proper external investigation was ongoing. And so can you imagine for a moment being inside the organization, you've blown the whistle, but nobody knows you're the whistleblower. This is exactly the situation that Per found himself in. Um, and in a lot of ways, from my perspective, I look at this through the lens of crisis communication. There were so many opportunities before it became a public crisis that the issue itself could have been managed. Yet the organization didn't take those opportunities to manage. But as all the news broke, um, he received word from actually one of his, 
his media contacts in Oslo that the story was going to break in the news. And the question that was asked ultimately of what he was and what he represented to the organization was, is the whistleblower a hero or a liability? So where Pear had been celebrated within the organization and, and as an abstract and also he himself as a whistleblower to make sure that the organization could do better. In a very short period of time, he became the representation of what it meant to, for the organization to have this ugly part of its history. He was the manifestation of all the crisis that had happened, even though he was the one who had tr given the opportunity for the organization to correct. And what I think is interesting about this particular case, but I think speaks to a lot of whistleblowing overall, is the complexity of whistleblowing cases, especially as they emerge into a public space. They are complex and there are some unique elements to the whistleblowing itself because it emphasizes and highlights the fluidity of the relationships between the crisis issue, whatever it was that the whistleblower was speaking about, corruption, whatever breakdown it was, the stakeholder, both internal and external, and certainly the organization. But what's interesting in this, when, when I talk about Pear becoming either the hero or the liability, is that the question of blame attribution is less a question of fact than it is perception. For some people who were further removed from the crisis, Pear was an absolute hero. He shined a light on something that needed to be fixed. However, within the local community, and certainly within the confines of the organization itself, he had brought something to light that was embarrassing, negative, and also would damage the community in terms of the funds spent within that community. But it also demonstrates the competing stakeholder interests during crises, and especially where whistleblowers are involved. It's never a clear cut, simple uh, experience. And it also, I think, shows a lot about the challenges and the courage to actually blow the whistle. Um, so there are a few lessons learned is that whistleblowers and the first of these is that whistleblowers bring to bear inconvenient truths for an organization. In the case of an organization like Norse Tipping, uh, can the organization serve the public good while offering gambling was an issue that actually began to emerge in the public conversation surrounding it. But that there's more to social responsibility than just the end. The road to get there matters just as much as the objective. So if the objective was about social responsibility and helping support sport and culture in the community, it's not enough that they do that. It's also that they have to be ethical throughout the process. So as Pear showed some inconvenient truths, I think this becomes clear for all whistleblowers, is that there's going to be something awkward about the organization beyond the crisis itself that emerges. Second is that in terms of, of any whistleblower context, I think there's often a disconnect between the behaviors and the stakeholders' expectations within and without the organization. So fishing junkets, uneven distribution of resources, all of this, including the ethics of responsible gaming, created tensions with different stakeholder groups. And which of those tensions mattered most became part of the challenge of managing the whistleblowing and how people reacted to different elements of the situation. If we put it in the context of trying to manage relationships with stakeholders, it also des demonstrates that these stakeholder expectations are vital for figuring out what an organization's actual responsibilities are and should be. But I think one of the biggest lessons learned is that with whistleblowing in particular, many crises are simply unavoidable. There were so many opportunities in, in Pear's discussion that all of the issues that connected with, with the public whistleblowing case could have been addressed. 
but there weren't the sufficient internal mechanisms to make sure that was the case. So as Sylvia was talking about in her introduction, ensuring that the organization itself is built to be crisis resistant and to make sure that it has a self-reflective component to it where complaints, concerns can be meaningfully addressed is absolutely vital. And the last thing I think that this case demonstrates is that blame attribution in whistleblowing is complicated. Nor organization committed a transgression. But oftentimes, the experience for the employee is that the whistleblower themselves is really the hidden enemy. There's the betrayal that's going to be felt by leaders and colleagues, criticisms that will come from the media, um, and ultimately, then the question of whether this person is trustworthy and a good team member that can follow them not only from the, the moment of or the organization that they've blown the whistle in, but throughout their careers. So this is something that has considerable risk and where blame attribution can be quite complex and challenging to understand. There will also be tensions within the local and the national community and how those are interpreted. So when it comes together, I think that that for me, the whistleblowing is such an interesting and dynamic situation that it makes it quite difficult for organizations to manage without having the necessary structures in place. And that's thank it. you. Thank you very much for your insightful accounts. Uh, especially seeing, you know, seeing whistleblowing from this lens of uh, crisis management, crisis communication is very interesting because then you really see how external stakeholders, the media in particular, are involved, uh, you know, and create also you know, uh, something even bigger uh, with all the complications and, you know, the implications of these. And um, I also like these uh, reflections about the op opportunity or, you know, uh, it's not easy, but to create or an ethical and effective organization, which is, you know, the aim actually, but it's not always uh, feasible and doable, especially when you see the whistleblower as the enemy yourself as an organization. So it's a, it's a tricky area <laughs> of practice. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like uh, now um, to ask uh, Giorgio Flaschini. Our second guest, uh, just to give you know uh, the same perspective, or at least to give, offer his own perspective on whistleblowing, uh, and then we have another round of uh, discussion together. Thank you, Audra. So, Giorgio, uh, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Yeah, I am. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you very much, <clears throat> um, and thank you, Audra, for uh, your perspective. Uh, just a really brief introduction about myself and why I'm here. I'm Giorgio Flaschini. I work for Transparency International. And Transparency International Italy is the Italian chapter of Transparency International, which is an international NGO working against, uh, against corruption, acting against corruption. I've been working on whistleblowing since 2008, so I've been, I think we, we have quite, quite a, big, a big experience on whistleblowing as Transparency International, because as an international network, we kind of have like the the international perspective, uh, the the possibility, the chance to uh, compare our systems, and uh, when we compare with the framework, legal and cultural framework, we see that uh, there are things such as whistleblow, which is not that different from country from to another country. So we could uh, find out some kind of common points on whistleblowing, which I'd like to share. Uh, uh, the most why I, I, I think whistleblowing is so is so relevant. It is so interesting because it has so many layers in, on it. Uh, when uh, we had when Silvia Ravazzani introduced introduced the the topic before, she talked about uh, uh, organizational whistleblowing more than other things. But whistleblowing is much more because whistleblowing can be internal, external, or public. So uh, this is really relevant because uh, the internal channel, the possibility to blow the whistle to some uh, recipient which is set up within the organization is just one option for the whistleblower. It's one option and uh, that is completely different from the other option because it's the 
the favorable option <laughs> if possible because uh, when you blow the whistle internally you can really affect uh, a quick and uh, effective change a timely change because uh, you are uh, reporting something to some people which can uh, that can act immediately to stop uh, the irregularity to correct uh, the the possible uh, uh, wrong proceeding uh, depending on what the person do the whistle on but if this is quite relevant and this is quite important why organizations should implement and promote effective whistleblowing procedures because if if you don't do it the whistleblower can go out, can go outside can go outside to regulators which can be like the enforcement authorities or like uh, sectoral regulators depending on what they want to blow the whistle on or they could go to the media so why uh, an organization should implement whistleblow effective whistleblowing mechanisms just to correct the issue, not only to correct the issue, but also to prevent possible other damages, also to prevent the fact that the person could blow the whistle outside. So I think the most important thing is that uh, organizations should convince employers, employees that uh, the, their environment is safe, that reporting internally is safe, because uh, the alternatives is not uh, the, the best one for them as well. Uh, and that's why I think that most organizations, especially the more structured one, are becoming more and more careful about whistleblowing and uh, like setting whistleblowing procedures that also allow, for example, for anonymous reporting, but uh, most of all that uh, provide for specific and uh, detailed procedures that uh, explain all the steps with the whistleblowing procedures, all the interaction that the whistleblower can have, the ways the, the whistleblower can interact with them. This is really relevant in my opinion because uh, uh, this is just an aspect of whistleblowing. So try to have the best possible internal procedure to prevent the whistleblower staying silent, which is bad for the organization because it doesn't make the organization understand what's going wrong with, with it, uh, or go it outside, which is much, much worse, of course. And, uh, and so this is, I think, the most relevant thing. Another thing that I'd like to, to highlight is that whistleblowing works on three levels. The first one is the, the legal level, so the, the protection and the, and the rights that all the interested parties have in whistleblowing. So, what happens to a whistleblower which is retaliated? What happens to the reported person after some allegations are brought against them? Uh, what happened to the recipient who mistreats the whistleblower report? So these kind of legal aspects are absolutely relevant. It's very important that uh, these uh, uh, rights are, all of them are considered. The system needs to be balanced. It needs to be balanced on what are the rights, uh, and the limits of a person cannot just tell everybody who he wants to to tell. Cannot just post on the on the internet of the company some allegations. He needs to follow some path, some path which is set up by the organization. And, but these are the juridical aspects of the of this. The other one is the organizational one. So the company needs to really promote whistleblowing. How can they promote whistleblowing in setting up an independent? Uh, an independent uh, body, internal body, with powers to uh, investigate a certain the fact that they are reported by the And this is absolutely relevant because uh, if you don't allow uh, the whistleblower to understand that uh, there is a safe path and there is a structured path and there is a, a good uh, independent recipient, of course, it cannot be that independent because most of times it's an internal body, but it has to be quite independent and uh, entrusted with powers to make uh, investigations, internal investigations, without involving too many parties, because the more the report is shared with people, the more is the, the possibility that uh, the identity of the whistleblower is exposed, uh, or maybe the facts are brought to the reported person, which in the first phase, the investigation, the verification of the facts, is, is, is important that this is kept as secure, as confidential as possible. And the third aspect, which is really related to this, is the, cult the cultural one. 
there needs to be some cultural uh, push from the top management about whistleblowing. And there is uh, how do you how do you create the culture? The cult you can create the culture in many ways by communicating frequently about the whistleblowing procedures, by explaining the results of the whistleblowing uh, mechanism. So maybe telling the results of it, which which has been fixed internally thanks to whistleblowing, but also in setting up procedures that work work quite well, work uh, create trust with the. Blower. So a timely answer to the whistleblower, uh, keeping the whistleblower involved, telling him about the outcome of the report. So this is creates a, a, like a, a, a cultural system where a whistleblower can uh, can feel safe and report internally instead of of going externally. That's why I think that uh, when Audra was talking before about hero or liability about the whistleblower, I'm always thinking about it's. It's not about on the whistleblower being a hero or a liability. It's on the organization. The whistleblower is not born whistleblower. Most of times he just blows the whistle. And what happens to him? It really depends on who blows the whistle to and how his report is treated and how he is treated as a consequence. Uh, as a consequence. So uh, that's important uh, uh, that uh, the whistleblower knows his rights, uh, that uh, he's informed. Uh, and uh, as Transparency International Italy and uh, all, uh, many other uh, Transparency International chapters, we have some advice centers for whistleblowers, just to explain them what are their rights, why they should report internally or not, why they could go externally or not, what could happen to them in case they report to a person, uh, another body, etc., etc. And this is really relevant because sometimes people don't understand how... Uh, how difficult is a whistle is being a whistleblower because sometimes it's really difficult sometimes it's not it really depends on the organization i just try to make some examples when a person maybe sees that something is going wrong within uh, within an office and maybe talks to the colleagues about it and then uh, the colleagues share his view uh, but say okay but they don't want to go further with it with it and maybe this same person decides to blow the whistle through an internal procedures. And then something happened to him. Even if the recipient treated the whistleblower report correctly, without it, but the person had exposed himself without knowing that he was exposing himself, just because he was sharing some views with some colleagues. So when this happens, it, see, it means that uh, the person was not informed. And sometimes people are just, uh, I, bad but ignorant about their rights and it's not their fault i think but at the same time uh, the employment position can be really risky anytime depending on your organization that's why it's important to have a balanced system that allows people also to go externally because when there is no path internal path which is secure it can be good going externally or sometimes it's better to advise them to stay silent because maybe the report is not detailed, uh, it's quite relevant, maybe it's a personal grievance more than a whistleblower report. And that's where uh, it's important advising people on what, what they could tell, where they should go. So there are a lot of uh, important things that uh, we need to, to keep in mind. So uh, I think uh, the advice that I can give in this, uh, in this meeting, because this meeting is really uh, addressed to uh, people thinking about inter in organizational communication, is that organizational communication is critical on this process. It's critical to keep the whistleblower internal and it's, cri it's critical to keep the whistleblower not silent. Uh, I think it's the absolutely the key of, uh, of how to make whistleblowing uh, work. And that's why whistleblowing is, is improving because uh, many, many more organizations are understanding this because they see what are the risks of a person going externally. They see what's, how the uh, whistleblowing, whistleblowing process is not working when people go externally. When I, I think that I'd like to say, and I'm closing with my speech now, uh, when people think about whistleblowers, they think about whistleblowers who became public. 
whistleblowers who I don't know, I think Chelsea Manning, Assange, this kind of individuals who went to the public, or maybe uh, some uh, people uh, that maybe reported internally and maybe they were retaliated or even fired because of the report. This is when whistleblowing doesn't work. Unfortunately, the good cases of whistleblowing are not really well known because uh, the perfect whistleblowing uh, episode is when a person blows the whistle to the correct uh, body. The correct body can treat the, the whistleblowing report correctly and they can fix the thing. It, maybe they, they don't get to fire the reported person, maybe they give a, a disciplinary sanction, or maybe they even don't give a disciplinary sanction because what the whistleblower report was just highlighting an uh, incorrect procedures internal to the organization, and the, the procedure is corrected. So this is the best possible whistleblowing scenario, and this is what uh, the organization should uh, promote as well and should make uh, known uh, to the whistleblowers. This is how normal whistleblowing works. The other case, the bad case, the hero case, uh, the victim case, these are not the good whistleblowing scenarios. So these are the scenarios for uh, organizations where, where whistleblowing doesn't work or where whistleblower didn't follow the, the best possible path for him or her and for the organization. Thank you. Okay, th thank you very much. I think you have offered uh, some very good, you know, um, elements about whistleblowing these layers about internal, external, public. So all these layers actually are being part of whistleblowing and uh, this idea of having this balanced system. So, of course, you have rights, but you also have duties and limits as a whistleblower. So you must have these arrangements that balance, you know, all these different elements. It also, it was interesting, Audra talked about this as well, about culture as a key element. So uh, coming from the top, uh, this uh, culture actually encouraging, you know, this open voice and this expression of dissent um, and the role of internal communication, internal procedures to solve somehow uh, the issue internally uh, before, you know, going public or externally. So thank you very much, really interesting. Um, I think that's uh, now Professor Matsai, uh, who'd like to ask you a question, so. Uh, thank you, Silvia, and uh, thank you uh, very much uh, to our speakers. Um, first of all, I'd like to underline uh, an aspect. The, the topic of whistleblowing is very, very important. Uh, as um, our speakers said just before, um, this is, it is a mean to uh, fight against corporate wrongdoing. And doing, such, doing this, of course, uh, the society as such can uh, benefit a lot. So it's very important. And at the same time, this is a kind of uh, um, unknowing topic, um, disregarded topic. So this is the reason why uh, at our Center for Employee Relations and Communication, we are dedicated uh, studies and a lot of attention to this topic because we want to contribute to raise the awareness uh, uh, toward um, this in the framework, as Professor Ravazzani uh, explained before, in the framework of voice, silence, and dissent in organization. So it's very important to us uh, to um, rise, to nurture this kind of, de of debate and to uh, discussion and dialogue with our students and external stakeholders. So uh, thank you very much uh, from my side to our speakers. Um, there are a lot of questions that could be uh, asked. Um, to Audra, I'd like to uh, ask if uh, you want to add a few words further about the perspective of organizations uh, future possible developments 
And um, if according to you, the current situation, for example, the pandemia can uh, affect in some uh, uh, ways uh, the development of whistleblowing in organizations. Yeah, I mean, I think that within organizations, one of the critical components to managing um, the environment and the culture is actually by making sure that there is a sense of of employee empowerment um, and also where and this is this is sort of the the Pollyanna component element of it where it's in a best case scenario you have a very functional organization where where everyone if they bring up and identify a potential risk has a voice and can actually respond and i think in most cases that works pretty well i think what pairs experience also highlights is that when you're blowing the whistle on the core decision-making structure within an organization, those structures sometimes don't respond nearly as well to, to the situation. So for example, Pear had worked um, earlier with, with the Norwegian Lottery on managing this challenge of how do you combine gaming with social responsibility? And actually he was, it was controversial um, but he was able to show and, and to, they were able to embrace this notion of responsible gaming, which is an example of, of the system working well. And how do you try and protect those who might have ga gambling addiction um, against the interest of the sport and culture components that were connected? But as it shifted to being, and that was, you know, a fundamental question of who they were as an organization. But when you shift that around to who was committing a genuine transgression, and it was the leadership that that system didn't work as well. So I think that there's always going to be an internal tension within an organization about how responsive and how the culture is managed. And that, I, I think that's the biggest com element for me that I learned you know, in really thinking about and reflecting on Pear's case um, as something that wasn't meant to be sensational, but ended up being quite a dramatic journey for himself and, and also for an organization and in a country where, where corruption and social, you know, all of that is set up to be as efficient and effective as possible. So they had all the routines in place. They had all of the structures that we should have been seeing, but when there's a personality at the top that prohibits it, that's the problem, I think. Thank you uh, so much, Oda. I have an, a question also for Giorgio. As you are a member of Transparency International, um, and uh, Transparency is an international association, Therefore, you have a very international perspective and point of view on this phenomenon. I'd like to ask you um, an opinion about the impact of the national cultures about perception. Because before we said that uh, uh, if the whistleblower is considered a, a hero or um, a, it's a senior or a liability is a matter of perceptions. So what about the impact of national cultures? Thank you. Yeah, of course, uh, cul cultural, uh, <laughs> cultural aspect matters a lot. Matters a lot, but I think that uh, as whistleblowing is becoming an international thing because uh, uh, if, if you think about whistleblowing in I'd say 20 years ago whistleblowing was present only in Anglo-Saxon scan only there in the US it has a long history and tradition uh, in the UK uh, actually the public interest disclosure act which is which has been for many years the reference law for whistleblowing is dated uh, 1998 so I would say that uh, Okay, if, if you ask me this question like 20 
TSO, I would say, yeah, it's a completely different world. It can only work there. But I think now in a globalization, in a globalized world, uh, things are changing. The cultural dis- differences are becoming a bit less, uh, I mean, a bit less severe, let's say. And uh, I think also in countries like Italy, I think the perspective now is different. I'm Italian, so I can reflect uh, the view of the of uh, like uh, my colleagues from all the counties, but it's, I can also reflect the fact that uh, when you were asking me uh, about uh, the culture in Italian whistleblowing, I was saying, okay, yeah, we have this saying, uh, uh, who is the spy is not son of Mary, which is like this wording that we have in Italy, which uh, if you make the spy, you're not, son, you're not the son of Mary, the mother of Christ. So this is like the worst thing ever. And whistleblower was a spy. But now I think that... Uh, Maybe we have, we still have some problems, some cultural problems uh, related on uh, how the whistleblower report is treated. So I see the cultural problem now more on the recipient than on people. People, I don't think they don't want to blow the whistle because they don't want to say things about other people, which was really like a trend like 20 years ago. But now things are changing here, are changing Eastern Europe a lot, because when I talk with my colleague in Eastern Europe, they, they keep saying to me that whistleblowing is becoming a thing there as well. Now we also have like a European directive on whistleblowing, which was approved last uh, December, which will become mandatory for all the countries by December 2021. Every European country, EU country, European Union country, will have to to transpose this directive and every country will have a whistleblowing law based on the directives. And the directive is good. So every any all the countries will have this this uh, this law. I think it, it it will be a process. It's not that from one day uh, okay, we have a whistleblowing law. Everybody will be confident in blowing the whistle. Nobody will be retaliated anymore. It will be a process. Even in UK, they can they keep saying that their law is not perfect. They need it's improving. And you you look at that law and say, well, okay, I'd, I'd say it's quite it's re- really good, but it's not good enough because it's always a process. We started a bit behind Italy, Eastern European countries, uh, but I think we are getting there as well. And I think there will always be space for improving. I can, I always think about uh, some trends on whistleblowing that change also based on uh, the organizational dynamics. For example, uh, when we thought about whistleblowing into in early 2000s, the thing was ah the UK has a perfect system, a tiered system. When you need to report internally, if you cannot report internally or you think you're unsafe, okay, you can go externally. Oh, you can go externally, and if you can, if you're not unsure, you don't find the channel. Okay, you can report to the public. Now the EU directive says no matter what you think, no matter how you feel, you can report internally or externally, depending on how you feel. It doesn't need to be like a bad internal whistleblowing system in order for you to go externally. You can go externally. I think this is an evolution of whistleblowing, which was based on the experience that came from multiple countries, multiple experiences. And so I think I think things change organizationally, uh, juridically, and also culturally. And I think, uh, okay, we are still a bit behind, but we are getting there from like uh, Mediterranean, Eastern European countries, I'd say continental European countries in general, compared to like uh, UK, US, uh, South Africa, and Japan. I have, I have a big longer history of with whistleblowing. Thank you, Jordi, for the news. Okay, so maybe uh, we can open up the debate just in case uh, we have, you know, questions from the audience or maybe some contributions that like to share with us. Um, So you can open your microphone or, well, you and students can also chat. So we just wait a couple of minutes to see if we have questions from the audience. Audra, hello. Yeah. 
Hi, Roberto. How are you? Hi, fine, fine. Um, I just turned my camera on. I am a colleague of Odra, but uh, just for once, let me say it. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Finalmente posso. Buon pomeriggio. Oh, grazie. Finalmente. Now, Odra, you are on the other side. <laughs> no, well, uh, uh, jokes, jokes apart. Um, Yes, I am from the Leeds Beckett Business School. I am a colleague of Odra, and uh, and uh, um, um, I collaborate with her partly. I am uh, not in the same subject group, but we have some uh, topic uh, uh, topics in in common occasionally. And this this topic of whistleblowing, uh, from from my point of view, I, I I'm more about uh, uh, business ethics and and uh, and. Uh, 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 sustainability and 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 uh, uh, topics like that persuasive persu cultures but whistleblowing is a, a very paradoxical and complex uh, uh, concept because it has got a sort of uh, internal uh, uh, contradictory status because uh, we live in a time where rightly uh, we have a, a, a big push a, a, a towards encouraging whistleblowing hmm? There is, there is a organization like obviously Transparency International. Uh, we, I, I, I thank Giorgio for his contribution. Obviously, they, they push towards fairness, accountability, responsibility, transparency. And, and uh, uh, um, so obviously we are at the, at the same time celebrating individuals who stood up against big organization and big corporations. So on the one end, uh, uh, whistleblowers are, 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 are heroes. On the other end, there is a push to make whistleblowing a moral obligation, and this uh, 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 situation, this this framework, creates a sort of logical incompatibility. Because if we celebrate whistleblowers as heroes, as saints, they have clearly gone beyond the call of duty. If uh, instead uh, uh, whistleblowing is a moral obligation, you know, this is what you have to do. Uh, and, and morality uh, leaves no place for praising, uh, uh, you know, if it is a duty. On the contrary, you know, we should, uh, 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 you know, uh, punish or, or we should uh, have a negative opinion against people who do not believe, uh, behave so. So whistleblowing is somehow, so the, the, the topic about whistleblowing and scapegoating and self-sacrifice, this is a very fascinating one. There is a paper in the Journal of Business Ethics about morality and whistleblowing that is absolutely mind-blowing, <laughs> if I may say so. Because uh, on the one end, uh, again, being a hero requires more than to do your duty. And this is impossible if whistleblowing is seen as mandatory or expected. So this uh, logical incompatibility is exactly where the notion of whistleblowing is one that really depends not only on how the question is framed, but also it depends on whether we're talking about ourselves or someone else. So it is a systemic view. So I think that we can really say something stimulating about whistleblowing if we embrace this contradiction. <laughs> and if we, if we take this fork, keeping both hands Keeping, let's say, if we want to use a systemic, a systemic um, uh, uh, lexicon, the unity of the difference between being a hero and being obligated. L'unità della differenza di queste due cose. So I think this is very interesting, and this is why Audra's story was exemplary from that point of view. I don't know if I made myself understood. I hope so. Well, and you know, there's. Um... This contradiction between the the morality of it, or the obligation, and whether it's something exceptional. In the 1990s, there was a U.S. car company called Saturn, and uh, it was eventually bought over. But at the time, it was an independent car manufacturer, and one of the things that that they highlighted in their advertising campaign, but also in the way that the organization worked, was that they wanted every single person on the factory line to be able to stop the production if they saw anything running amok functionally to be what is is in a in an idealized way a whistleblower within the organization and they were actually celebrating that in some ways they were making um the the meme of being a hero something that was quite ordinary and every day that and they had examples of it that they 
that in their early manufacturing process um, that they put in place. But what was key with the Saturn case was that they empowered their employees to feel strong enough and comfortable enough that they could do that. So I think you can get over some of the moral contradictions if the organization is strong enough to set up the positivity in the environment, the empowerment of the environment, so that those kinds of issues can get addressed. You know, from a risk perspective, great. If you have, if you see something on an on a manufacturing line or in an office environment with appropriation appropriate spending or whatever it might be, you would want an environment in an organization where people could say, "Hey, something looks weird here," and that it would actually get the time of day. So I don't know that there necessarily has to be a tension between the moral obligation and the hero. They're still they're still doing the work to point it out, but they're also empowered by the organization, which is the moral obligation. But I don't think I also don't think that that happens in a lot of organizations. If I'm a cynically honest, if it, that's my cynical honest opinion. Yeah, th thank you for your question and also for your answer. Probably, Giorgio, you want to add something on this? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, if we can. Um, uh, I think uh, internally an organization doesn't want to think about whistleblowers as heroes. And I don't, I don't think that they want to think about whistleblowers as morally obligated to report as well. I think an organization needs to find uh, and needs to set up uh, the right system for people being confident, as Oda told, to go to to speak up, and I think that's that's the important thing for an organization. Whistleblowing can work even if I want to report my colleague because I don't like him. It doesn't mean to be okay. I need to report about him because it's the right thing to do. He's doing it wrong. Maybe I don't like him because uh, he's some pleasant. Uh, he's dirty. I don't know. Whatever the, the reason, the important thing of whistleblowing is setting up a system when a whistleblower can report safely, when when he can report a good qualified report, not just saying he stole money, whatever. What can I do about that? If you tell me, stole money. you need to tell how he stole, what it what he did, and. For an organization, it's more important that I sent an, a detailed report, that I sent a report because I like my organization, I want the organization to be safe for the bad guys. The, the motive is irrelevant. The motive is not a matter anymore. Even in all the new laws that, are been, uh, that, has, that have been uh, enacted in recent years, the subjective uh, opinion, the subjective feeling of the whistleblower is, is stuck out. He doesn't have to be motiv motivated by like good faith. This kind of requirement are not considered anymore. What it matters is the, the object of the report and the fact that he followed the procedures or the rules or the law in, in, on how to report. Because the important thing is he doesn't damage the process. And damaging the process can also be like uh, uh, libeling or defamating another person. This is working badly with the process. But if you could follow the correct step, you can also report your colleague because you don't like him. And that's the key for organization. Create secure ways in how and people need to be confident in speak up. Motivation, okay, you can push off the, on the fact that uh, the, the organization is super cool. You need to protect your, your workplace. If you protect your workplace, your, your uh, job will be more secure as well. I mean, you can push what, however you want. But the thing is, create a space and a way where he can report uh, in a secure way. Okay, thank you very, very interesting, uh, especially this uh, question and comments by Adalberto, uh, because it's true there's some kind of contradiction, but from your words, it seems like whistleblowing should become like normality to avoid these contradictions so and so in this sense the whistleblowing arrangements and procedures and a, a good culture are very important to create these conditions for an ethical organizations uh, organization in which we don't need heroes or victims but just people you know <laughs> saying things and voicing 
uh, things uh, uh, in a very straightforward way. Um, so we have uh, also some questions uh, in the chat. Um, one is actually um, related to this uh, discussion um, by Martina, uh, because she understands why you are giving to feeling obligated of blowing the whistle a bad connotation. And she's asking, isn't it better if workers report bad behaviours as such? Uh, I would say yes, but I don't know if you want to add just um, a sentence uh, about this, uh, Audra, Georgia, or whoever is like. I just think a lot of it comes down to the norms and no, they shouldn't feel bad about it. But I think sometimes there's pressure for conformity and pressure for fitting in in a lot of organizations and and that can create an, an inhibiting environment. Yeah, yeah, I, I would add one thing. I, I, the, I mean, I understand the point of the question. Absolutely, I understand the point. Uh, my work is advising whistleblowers. Uh, most of the times, people kind of feel morally obligated to blow the whistle. And they blow the whistle because they feel morally obligated to do so. But they shouldn't be morally obligated to do that. Because uh, when you don't have like a secure workplace a secure system for blowing the whistle and you you do it you suffer consequences the only consequence is that nothing happens to the person who was committing like a wrongdoing the organization really doesn't care because maybe you weren't reporting like the most important wrongdoing in the world but just some minor wrongdoing so maybe the organization tolerates it but the consequence for the whistleblower is huge he could have his career destroyed, completely blocked. And when we think uh, uh, to workplaces, maybe sometimes we think about uh, uh, some positions where, uh, OK, I can, I'm not that confident anymore in this job. I can find another one. But uh, I work a lot, for example, with public uh, whistleblowers. And I think maybe Southern Italy, where a person maybe has a job there. And if he loses that job, he won't find another one in 50 kilometers. And this, he blows the whistle because he feels morally obligated to do so. But he maybe blows the whistle in an environment where he just is retaliated and nothing happens. So how what this moral obligation is leading him? That's the problem. If we leave, if we could live like in a wonderful utopic world where okay, there is this moral obligation that I like, I, I love. It's where why I started working on whistleblowing. But then the world is different because it's not structured in a way that can respond to this moral obligation. Uh, that's why I, I don't know if I mentioned before, but sometimes I need to advise people not blowing the whistle, which is crazy if you think about that, because I work in Transparency International. I should be for like uh, blowing the whistle on everything which is wrong. But we need to think about the life of people. What can happen based on his report? What can happen to him because of his report? And that's really huge, a huge part of whistleblowing. And that was the part that Pear didn't anticipate. And quite frankly, I don't think anyone in, that he reported to had anticipated um, because of how long the investigation dragged on and some of the things that occurred. I mean, it it genuinely turned his life upside down. He was in a position where he could he could make a change, but you know, part of what he talks about in his interviews, and I think that this is something that anytime I've heard accounts from whistleblowers where it was a pretty serious case, is that there is a lot of emotional drain and a lot of emotional trauma in a lot of ways that goes on through us because there are personal consequences for it. OK, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, a question from Noemi. Um, so uh, it's actually about the 
premises. So uh, the connection to voice, silence and uh, dissent. Uh, maybe, Alessandra, you also want to say something about this? Um, yes, Silvia, sure. Um, I, I used uh, these terms before uh, and I was referring to um, the communication arena uh, of organizations. If we look at uh, organizations as a communication arena, we can say that uh, uh, people that work for the organization, employees, managers, whatever, they can have communication behaviors that can consist in voice behaviors or silence behaviors. Um, and both voice and silence can be um, positive, supportive, or uh, negative, um, damaging. So, for example, silence can uh, protect sensitive information uh, relevant for uh, a company. Uh, but sometimes uh, uh, silence, unfortunately, uh, just hide dissent. Uh, this is the case that uh, has been mentioned several times this afternoon when people um, witness questionable actions and they do not feel safe in order to report them because they are uh, afraid uh, for the negative consequences. So silent can be sometimes be uh, actually um, a dissenting silence. Uh, and this, from this point of view is a negative uh, silence. On the other hand, voice can be uh, most of most of time uh, silence is positive supportive but of course voice can also be aggressive negative uh, not constructive um, voice when voice is positive um, it means that uh, people voice their ideas opinions and also uh, they can report and voice their uh, dissent so they can uh, raise issues and this is the case of uh, whistleblowing because when people whistle uh, blow the whistle they are um, they are expressing uh, a positive a constructive dissent this is my vision about voice, silence, and dissent, and their relation uh, with the uh, whistleblowing. Yeah, I would just add. Uh, actually, Giorgio talked about this: uh, the fact that the system should be balanced. So, of course, we see, you know, we see as uh, a constructive voice that these whistleblowers express uh, somehow to correct wrongdoing in the organizations but uh, in organizations but of course they, they, there should be limits and rules how to do so what kind of issue you can raise and, and how so it's very important to have the culture first and the instruments um, too uh, and we also have uh, actually this question by martina we have another question i think relates a little bit to all this uh, because she's asking so first, are whistleblowers in any way protected after blowing the whistle? Because we said uh, there might be retaliation, there might be, you know, consequences. Um, and, and she asked, so if I know that I'm going to be fired and not being able to find a new job because of the bad review I get from my ex-boss, so what's the point of doing it? So I don't know, Audra Giorgio, if you want to say something about this. Well, from a legal perspective, in the countries that do have and and the the laws protecting, they can't be. That doesn't necessarily mean that it becomes an easy environment to stay in. So the degree to which employees can be protected before an issue goes before a whistleblowing issue goes public. So the, when it's still within the organization, it's a lot easier to protect them than when it goes outside the organization because as soon as the media coverage comes in that 
then it creates the reputational issue for the organization. The organization is going to do everything it can. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in those kinds of situations, the more that it can be resolved from within, the easier it is to protect your own job, basically. I mean, and that's, you know, if there are mechanisms that work and when whistleblowing works, which as Giorgio has pointed out is most of the time, it create risk to the organ to you as a and your professional development it may cause you know some manager somewhere along the line to be a little grinchy with you but you would ask for a different referee quite frankly it's only when you bring in in my view the public face on it that that creates the most personal and professional risk when you're in countries that have um proper regulations that mean that you can't be fired retaliatory it doesn't mean, though, that if you have a very negative organization, that there couldn't be ways to make your life uncomfortable. And and so there, a lot's going to depend on the organization's culture, on the particular actors, and a lot of factors. But the legal protections are the first bit. Yeah, yeah. If can I, if I can add something, uh, I, I think that. I think the moral obligation comes in as well here, because I know a lot of cases where a person prefers to risk some consequences on, on his work position than stay silent. There are these cases. I don't know if you're aware of the famous case of Andrea Franzoso. He blew the he blew the whistle on uh, his employer basically because it was the chairman of uh, FNM, the railway company, and uh, he lost his job because he couldn't keep his job, because uh, when you blow the whistle on the top management, you cannot keep the job. That's, that's the case, especially if you come out as like uh, open whistleblower, so without being an anonymous whistleblower. This is one, one, one case. The other case is where uh, there are safe mechanisms in place, because uh, how whistleblowing works? Whistleblowing works when uh, they, uh, so well made that uh, the whistleblower himself uh, is just an alerter. If a person that tells the organization, look there, look there and you'll find out that uh, that person is stealing, uh, that 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 uh, process is wrong, that there is wrongdoing there. The perfect whistleblowing mechanism is a mechanism where I, as a whistleblower, blow the whistle to a person, to Audra, for example, which is uh, the audit manager in a company. She makes a notification in a note to verify information. She doesn't have to tell that uh, she gets to, to do this verification because someone blew the whistle. She's just doing random verification on processes and she finds out and she finds the evidence to basically to back up the report, the original report that she got from me. That's the perfect whistleblowing system where I alert her. I also tell her where to look, where to find the evidence. So where I help her in finding out the wrongdoing. But where I'm completely left off, besides to make a disciplinary proceeding against the report, she will do based on the evidence that she could collect, not based on my testimony. In this case, the whistleblower is is in a perfect position because he blew the whistle and uh, there is a recipient which is in a good, important position to verify the facts uh, and to act, to act on the facts, basically. So that's how it works. But of course, not all the organizations have, do, have done like that. That's why we sometimes advise people to blow the whistle. Sometimes we tell them not to blow the whistle because maybe they're exposed and so it will be easy to get the, the if if an action is made against someone is because Giorgio told them about that. So in this case, uh, I try to think to the fact, for example, there is an office with two people or three people and uh, one person reports another one. And probably the whistleblower report could come from one or two people. This person can be protected? No, it cannot. So, or if he feels more obligated to blow the whistle anyway, or if he blows the whistle, he will be exposed. So he needs to decide, is it worthy? It's not, or is it not worthy? 
And this, that depends a lot on the, on the organizational culture. If the culture of the organization uh, praises this kind of conduct rather than the conduct of the person who's actually committing their own doing. So I think as everybody's saying, both Oda and Silvia, we're saying it depends a lot on the organization, on the culture, on the structure, on the procedures that are set up. But there are a lot of cases where a whistleblower can blow the whistle and things could be could go smoothly. It's not always like that, unfortunately. But there are cases. May may uh, may I very briefly add an observation related to uh, what Giorgio was saying just uh, right now? Um, I think that uh, uh, we still blow in arrangements. Uh, it it's uh, in itself um, a signal, a communication um, action. Uh, by means uh, um, for an organization to say that the organization wants to fight wrongdoing and that the organization um, absolutely prefers transparency and open communication climate. So from a, from a, communi a corporate communication point of view, uh, whistleblowing arrangements are uh, a communication tool to to express the position of the organization of the management um, that they are against corporate wrongdoing and that they are on the side of an open communication climate this is very important to me as a communication scholar Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. I don't see new questions in our chat. Uh, maybe, um, I don't know, someone else will, wants to uh, open the microphone and say something. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's been a very interesting debate. We have uh, touched upon many different aspects of whistleblowing and uh, I will bring, you know, home with me many keywords, many, you know, inspiring points. So, uh, well, thank you everybody for your contributions. That's um, actually um, here, uh, Marta, uh, she's, she has a question for, for us. Um, so, she's asking, is uh, having an internal whistleblowing channel. Uh, is this also useful for the organization because when needed, it can solve problems, scandals uh, discovered by employees privately inside a company? So I would say yes, it's in internal whistleblowing. Uh, so without publicizing the whole scandal, risking the loss of many stakeholders' relationships and so on, which relates a little bit to what Audra uh, said. So I, I would say so, and uh, Georgia also underlined this. Uh, the 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 best would be to have internal channels and uh, you know and arrangements in place so that you can somehow solve uh, inside the organization the problem. But as you said, it's also important uh, for those organizations uh, that do not have a culture or you know a system in place to have external channels as well, because in case employees that can still go for these external channel uh, channels and they have uh, the chance to blow the whistle uh, safely or at least uh, uh, as much as possible. So uh, that would be at least uh, if I can summarize what we have said so far a little bit. Matters comment, uh, which is uh, very uh, very important, uh, and Sophia is uh, asking uh, another question: uh, if um, uh, there's some wrongdoing inside the organization, and there's not a secure and effective procedure to solve the problem, and how can a whistleblower, you know, highlight the problem? So how can she or uh, he be heard, be heard? So through these external channels, uh, I don't know, Giorgio, especially you were talking about this. Uh, I don't know if you want to add uh, something about this uh, externally expressed uh, uh, whistleblowing. Um. Yeah, uh, external channels basically are, uh, they can be two different external channels. They could be a regulator or the enforcement authority. I think the, the difference between them is that uh, when you contact a regulator, usually you're not like uh, denouncing a person. 
but uh, it's kind of an internal channel, but not with an internal, not to an internal body. So you are trying to approach like a kind of intermediate actor, uh, which has really good knowledge of the sector you're working on, and uh, can uh, dialogue and interact with you in order to address the, the thing without, in many cases, uh, having like a formal recordings of the report as it is like a report of georgia against someone when you go to the enforcement authority i can say what happens in our country in italy it depends a lot on who receives your report but when you go to the police they you can find for example people that, you know, and you can find uh, an official that says, "Okay, we can record it uh, anonymously or not." I don't want. I don't. Want to, I will only want open uh, open whistleblowing. So, if you need, if you want to make an allegation against someone, you need to formally uh, make an allegation. External reporting is much more difficult. Going to the police is not the same as reporting internally through an internal channel. So, it's not an easy path. But sometimes it's easier that going internally. I'm thinking we're the top manager, high level in the company. And you think that the internal body for which not how can you report internally and think that A, you will be protected and B, something will be will be done. It's really hard, it's really difficult that this happens. So in these cases, you can decide to go externally or to the media, of course, anonymously, hoping that they cannot find the source. But uh, these are of like secondary options, but sometimes it's the only options that you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can be safer mm -hmm. than the internal ones. I don't think they're advisable because uh, internally, the organization wants to fix the pro problem. Externally, who received the reports want to verify if there was a problem to give sanctions. And so there is a difference. And, and most of times when the, there is like a kind of dilemma, especially in small organizations, because if you're reporting something which is really hard, which is really severe, and you report it externally, and maybe they do a verification, they go and they find out, they do investigation, they find out that this problem was, this wrongdoing was real. And maybe do this wrongdoing, and the verification of that could lead to a lot of sanctions for the company that could jeopardize the existence of the company itself. I'm thinking about like small organization. It's really difficult that is confident in blowing the whistle externally because he could jeopardize his position even without being exposed as the whistleblower because he is jeopardizing the organization. But at the same time, when people contact us about that, we are always saying, is this a workplace you feel confident in working within uh, in like five years? Because if this company is, if this company is, is, stays alive because it's completely wrongdoing, it could collapse any time. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, your reporting or maybe your colleague your reporting or the random check from the fiscal authority. I mean, uh, people always have to consider all the environment they're in. And, and uh, I don't think there are two equal whistleblowers. Everyone is in a different position. Everybody needs to understand where he is, how his organization is positioned on the topic, how the organization is positioned in the, the marketplace. And he needs to decide uh, what to proceed, evaluate the risks, evaluate the rights, not just uh, talking for talking, it's really hard. I know a lot of people that just didn't, didn't want to be, they didn't know they were blowing the whistle. They think they were just talking to the employer or to the or a colleague. They were blowing the whistle. They didn't know what they were. And that uh, activated a consequence that they couldn't expect, of course. And sometimes it happens. So being aware of where you are, how we, your position is the most important thing. I I know that it's a really bad thing of, to think about your workplace because as soon as you see that something is going wrong, you need to be careful because how this wrong could be like a chance, something like incorrect proceeding that can be easily fixed or can be because someone did that and maybe there was there is someone that uh, uh, accepted that, someone above that accepted that. 
uh, it's a, it seems a horrible way to work, a horrible world <laughs> to work in. But uh, mm -hmm. most of times, this is these are workplaces. That's how workplaces are made. So it's important to consider everything. Yeah. That's also why we are here to talk about yeah. these issues and to create more awareness. So uh, it's very important. Uh, that's, um, that's another question. I don't know, Audrey, if you want to add something on this or I just go on with the next question because we're approaching the end of this uh, fantastic time together. Uh, I think this refers actually to something Giorgio mentioned before, uh, this new law uh, in Europe um, in 2021 about whistleblowing, of course, uh, if you know if this is going to be, you know, like a, a standardized uh, uh, legislation or if it's going to be adapted according to each country. For me? Yeah, we couldn't hear you. Yes. Ah, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, no, no. sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, no, this is a EU directive, so it needs to be transposed in national legislation. Of course, uh, the directive has a lot of principles. Sometimes some some are uh, mandatory, some are like uh, not mandatory, so the country can decide uh, which one to transpose or not. In Italy, we already have a legislation, so during the transposition, we have like we already have more favorable uh, provisions for whistleblowers that cannot be touched by the transposition of the directive. But uh, the idea of this directive is also to create like an harmonization in Europe uh, within the legislation on whistleblowing. Because most of times, especially when I think to like uh, multinational companies, uh, they need to behave differently in different environments because there are some rights in one country, some other rights in other countries. Uh, so that's uh, that's what the European Union wanted to do. Another thing, the European Union wanted to force some countries that were really reluctant in adopting whistleblowing legislation in adopting one and now they need to adopt one which has a lot of like mandatory obligations which are quite demanding on organizations and uh, but this has to be done so uh, <laughs> countries cannot be cannot uh, avoid doing that and this obligation will uh, involve will also be uh, for the private sector and also for medium companies uh, over 50, 50 employees, they need to have like a whistleblowing system in place. Uh, they will have until 2023 to adapt to the new obligations, but also minimum organization will be obligated. Uh, now only like companies comp in the private sector, sector, for example, in Italy, there's a limited law. In other countries, it's really advanced. For example, in France, it's, it's really advanced. They just enacted one. In Italy, it's not that much, so there will be like a big change for private companies and uh, we should do effects on the directive. Okay, thank you. Uh, very clear. Um, okay, I think uh, this is uh, basically the end uh, of this uh, very interesting event. So I want to thank you first, our guest speakers, for their very, uh, you know, uh, insightful contributions to these debates and also to all people attending asking questions or you know um giving us their comments uh, so for contributing to these uh events so uh thank you very much everybody um so goodbye thank you so much, yeah? thank you so much also from my side it's uh, it was a pleasure having audra and giorgio and also a lot of participants with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you both for Thank inviting you. me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. As well. And if you have more Thanks. questions coming in the next day, just share my contacts with no problem. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.